Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Broderson, and today I'm accompanied by my co-host, Robert Leonard from Real Estate 101, and Dan Hanford from PassiveInvesting.com. Dan, welcome to the show. Stig, Robert, thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to sharing with the audience today. Fantastic. And, you know, inflation is all the rage right now. And like every other investor out there, I'm just worried about keeping my purchasing power intact and real, and real assets. And I should then say most noticeable real estate really comes to mind here. So with that said, we are quite excited to provide an audience who are primarily stock investors the opportunity to learn more about how to diversify into a different asset class. And Robert, I know you have the very first question for Dan. Real estate markets, Dan, have become so expensive and competitive recently that local and state governments are actually starting to feel the need to intervene. Atlanta has recently put limitations in place for Airbnb investors. And Dallas, where I know you have properties, is even considering putting in laws and regulations to slow down real estate investors. As part of your underwriting process, you stress test your properties at 60% or less occupancy, you use conservative rental rates and occupancy rates, and you build into your business plan at least eight months of reserves. In a market environment that is so competitive and full of capital, how are you finding and acquiring properties that fit all of your criteria? Well, I will, I will tell you that it's very challenging. You know, right now in, in the market, you know, we're, we're underwriting, you know, dozens and dozens of deals every single week. And it's very hard to find deals that actually pencil. And then when we find deals that we feel like pencil, we go, we try to put a great strong offer in and we get to the best and final round in some of these assets. Or, because our group acquires assets that are in the kind of 20 to $30 million low end range, upwards to maybe 100, 110 million. So the types of assets that we're looking at, there's usually a lot of, you know, of, of good quality buyers. And so there's a lot of competition and there's a lot of institutional buyers. And so when we're competing with them, uh, we obviously have to do, do a few things to kind of stand out, maybe have some additional hard money that's the earnest money deposit that goes uh, non-refundable day one. And there's some additional earnest money deposit that goes non-refundable uh, you know, after the due diligence period. And we're talking about significant, like seven figures of earnest money deposits. So we're not talking about just putting down, you know, the, the typical, you know, you know, uh, 10,000, 20,000, you might see in some of these smaller assets. These are pretty large assets. So the, the earnest money deposit has to be meaningful. And uh, so that's one of the ways that we stand out. Then at the end of the day, you know, a lot of it has to do with the purchase price. And so, you know, we, we, we pass on a lot of deals because when we do our underwriting very conservatively, we have, certain metrics that we have to hit that we want that we know that we want to hit as investors we also know that our investors want to be able to hit as well and we won't be successful in that asset if we can if we can't hit some of those return metrics and so for us being able to find out assets that hit those return metrics and, and and having a maximum amount that we are willing or able to pay for that asset allows us to uh you know having the even more challenging time trying to find assets because we pass on a lot of them because the bid on these assets goes way up higher um, than what we can afford. And a lot of times we'll get into the best and final round and feel like we were going to get awarded the deal. And then somebody comes in at the last minute and bids it up, you know, several million dollars more. And it just doesn't make sense to us at that point. Whose earnest money are you using in these deals? When you talk seven figures for an earnest money, are you just taking that out of the capital you've raised? Well, I mean, you know, oddly enough, you know, with our types of uh, our types of acquisitions, we're raising all of our money from contract to close. So, earnest money deposit actually has to be submitted within two days after contract signing. And so, we don't raise the funds until we get closer to you know uh, a week or two down the road. Once we actually get all the documents sent out, we do our you know, you know webinar to promote the offering. And so, we actually use our own personal capital to be able to do that. So, we've never had to use. Uh, outside capital or, you know, had to ha be even more risky and use the offerings money because you never know. I mean, at the end of the day, it's possible that the offering, you know, the, the closing might not occur and you have to, you know, either eat that earnest money deposit or somehow try to get it back. And so we've been very conservative with that and said, you know, we're just going to put our own, you know, neck out there on the line and our partners. We have three managing partners, myself, Daniel Randazzo and Brandon Abbott. And between the three of us, we put up all of our earnest money deposit. And uh, so far up to this point, we have never lost earnest money. So that's, that's a good thing. And uh, every deal that we put under contract, we've been able to close. So uh, it's a good track record to have. And of course, it gives us more confidence when we're going out there and putting, you know, three or four million dollars on, uh, on, 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 on an asset that's hard in non-refundable day one. Hmm. Interesting. 
Well, I think that's a good segue uh, to the next question here, Dan, because in the personal finance world, there are a few different general rule of thumbs for emergency funds. And there is a similar approach in the real estate world. Uh, some funds and investors are a bit more conservative, aiming for closer to 12 months of reserves. And then the others are a bit more aggressive and are okay with three months. Why has your firm chosen to keep at a minimum eight months of reserves and stress test as a 60% occupancy rate? Um, how has this benefited or perhaps hindered your business throughout the years? Yeah, so I would say one of our, one of our, our earlier assets, we didn't have enough operating reserves and we were doing a major renovation on that property and with not having the major operating reserves off to the side that we could potentially pull, we actually ended up not being able to, uh, we ended up getting to a position where we may have not been able to complete the renovation plan because the renovations went over our budget, right? And so one of the things that we had to do was is the partners actually had to loan the asset money to be able to keep it, af- not keep it afloat, but to be able to pay for the additional renovations so that we can continue to maintain the returns for investors. And so with that particular asset, you know, even though in the operating documents and in the operating agreements, we're allowed to charge interest if we loan the property money, we just didn't feel it was prudent to do that because we don't, we don't necessarily want to make our investors feel like we're just loaning money to the property to, to make extra money, right? And so we gave a no, no interest loan to the property and we held on to that note until we ended up selling that asset. We sold that asset for higher than the projections that we had had originally, so it was a great return for our investors as well as us. Um, but that's one of the, the one of the lessons that we learned early on is that we want to make sure we have we have plenty of operating reserves. And so what we try to do is we have so so, so some groups might say they have you know, you know twelve months of operating reserves. You know we're at eight. Uh, what we what, but with us, our operating reserves at eight months is actually if the property goes down to 0% occupancy, we can continue to support the property and pay the debt service and the expenses for eight months, right? But the chances of the property going down to 0% is pretty remote. But if you look back in the last 100 years, all the recessions uh, and economic you know, uh, uh, cycles that have occurred, the, the recessions don't normally last more than about 15 to 18 months. So as long as you can hold on to that property, continue to you know, support the property for at least 24 months, um, or even 18 months, right? We, we always plan for 24 months. Then on the, if you can hold on to that asset to the other end, then you'll do really, really well. And so for us, even though we have this you know, eight months of operating reserves, we're not going to go down to 0%, right? And so with that, that eight months of operating reserves will actually get us farther down the road. And when some people say they have 12 months of operating re- reserves, they really don't have 12 months of operating expenses and to go all the way down to 0% occupancy. They have a certain number that they would say, if it drops below 25% occupancy or 30% occupancy, we can continue to support the property for 12 months, right? Um, Which again, that's just our conservative nature. And when we looked at in the beginning doing this, it reduced the returns for investors for sure. Because when you have a large operating reserve, you actually have to raise more money. The more money you raise, the lower the return is for all of the investors in the deal. But at the same time, that return only reduced it by about 100 basis points. So one percentage point is all it reduced it by. And so for us and our investors, they're like, absolutely, I'll give up 1% of my return profile to mitigate any future risks of capital calls and uh, any types of, of issues of uh, potentially losing the property or anything like that, or the property happened to take loans to support itself. So we, can, we actually do that to be able to make sure that we have a, a much more conservative deal and yes, we have to bring on more money, but at the end of the day, it allows everyone to be able to sleep well at night. That's that swan principle, right? Sleep well at night. And uh, so we have a lot of operating reserves that uh, we can make sure we can sustain the property, even if there are some economic pressures that come, come, come across. The capital call you mentioned and your debt structure is where that risk come from, comes from. And I want to talk about that for a second because smaller individual real estate investors are typically pretty limited. In the, financing, in the financing options that they have available to them. Whereas large funds such as yourself who are acquiring multi-hundred unit properties actually have access to a lot more financing options such as family offices, hedge funds, and sometimes even insurance companies. Who does PassiveInvesting.com typically obtain its debt financing from? And how is it most commonly structured? Yeah, so uh, it depends on the market, right? So, so there's been sometimes... There's usually like, you know, six to nine to 12 month periods where it kind of changes and shifts based on the debt market out there that's available at the time. So 
There's been times where we've used agency financing, whether it be Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, and we get fixed rate financing that's long term, you know, seven, 10, 12 year terms, uh, with usually some interest only periods for the first, you know, three to five to seven years, depending on the asset and the market. And then uh, most recently, we've been doing uh, bridge debt. So we're using, using some of the options that you, you mentioned. So we've actually used some life, life insurance companies. We've used hedge funds. We've used other private funds. Uh, we haven't used any, any family office money, but it's mostly just been those other institutional level funds that, uh, that we've obtained our debt from. And they, and they have a, a floating rate, which is a little more risky, but it also provides the ability to not have any type of, of, of prepayment penalties, if you will, that will cause the, the performance of the property to start to go down if you try to sell it earlier than, you had, than, you, than what you had originally projected. And you know, right now, with the current market and the types of assets that we're buying, the bridge debt seemed to, be, it seemed to have a better uh, uh, terms for us. Now, obviously, with the, the capital markets, in a, in a major state of flux at this point in time, like we're, we're today sitting on, 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 a, on, a, on a day where we actually have uh, the Fed going to be probably increasing the, the, the Fed rate by about 50 basis points, right? And so there's a lot of flux that's happening right now. And you know, a lot of, um, a lot of the, the floating rates now, instead of being based off of LIBOR, or they're now being based off of SOFR. And so there's a lot of uh, structure changes there as well. Uh, but typically, as far as the structure is concerned, uh, if it's an agency debt, you're usually going to have right now a little bit lower loan to value. So it's going to be like 55 to 65 percent loan to value. When you're using some sort of bridge debt, you're going to see that uh, tick up a little bit, maybe 65, 70. If you're lucky, 75 percent. Um, but usually we're, we try to stay between that 65 to 70 percent range when it comes to a, a bridge debt option that's there um, to, be able to, be able to be able to make the cost of capital uh, kind of more, more cohesive and the returns a little bit better for the investors and, and lower risk. So, uh, uh, Dan, I wanted to transition and talk a bit about taxes. And I can already feel like the audience are like, taxes. That's, the, that's, that's not typically the most exciting topic for most people. But it is for me, and I know it is for Robert, because you know, it's, a, it's a game of, of making the most money, and taxes are an expense. And so one reason why I'm very excited to learn more about passive investing investing.com uh, and one of the reasons why Robert and I have considered investing in some of your, your properties is that um, I've recently realized that uh, real estate is more advantageous to me than stock investing from a tax perspective. So my company for different reasons have been restructured and so a 10% stock investing return for me is not equivalent to a 10% uh, real estate uh, return. And I have this unique situation that uh, some of the listeners know, know about, like it, I'm investing through a company, I'm a Danish citizen, so I don't pay any taxes locally and all dividends are tax-free. And that probably sounds great. And people are probably just going to be like, yeah, that's fine for you, Stick. But what about me? Uh, so I just wanted to explain that going to this question because um, we, um, we wanted to look, know, like for the vast majority uh, of our listeners who are American, um, I guess I have two questions in, in, in one. How are Americans typically taxed uh, whenever they make investments with you? And is there any way that they can lower their taxes? Yeah, so when it comes to the types of assets that we acquire, obviously they're, 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 they're large, high-quality assets, and they have a lot of depreciation available on them because we every single one of our assets, we actually do what's called a cost segregation study. And so the smaller investors might not have heard of that before, but we basically have uh, a asset. We actually have a, an outside engineer firm come into each one of our assets. The IRS is one that requires us to have the outside engineer firm come in, and they piecemeal the property down to the sheetrocks and the studs and the appliances and the countertops and the flooring and the, the shingles on the roof, and they, we can piecemeal the property down to accelerate depreciation. And so instead of, I can say, in, for example, like in a, in a multifamily offering, like the, the, the one in Savannah, Georgia, that we're doing right now, this particular one uh, is a multifamily deal. And there's three different levels of depreciation that are available for investors in our offerings. There is straight line depreciation, which is pretty standard, right? It's 27 and a half years for residential properties, including multifamily. So even though uh, multifamily is considered CRE, commercial real estate. It actually still is classified as residential in the, IRA, in the eyes of the IRS. So you get 27 and a half year straight line depreciation schedule. And then, of course, on the commercial side, it's 39 years. So you can depreciate that, just basically take the value of the property minus the land, divide it by 27 and a half or 39. And that's how much depreciation you get every single year. But then there's two other additional levels of depreciation that you can obtain, which is 
accelerated depreciation. And that's where that cost segregation study comes into play, where you can actually piecemeal the property down. And in certain parts of the property, you can actually accelerate to the first five to 15 years based on the life expectancy schedule that the IRS gives us based on the items that are in the property. And so what that allows us to do is to really front load a lot of the depreciation of those first five to 15 years, which allows investors to have really high depreciation benefit. So on our assets, well, I'll, I'll mention that in just a moment, well, what we kind of see usually on our assets, but the third level of depreciation is bonus depreciation, right? And so any time of renovations or anything like that we're doing on the property in those first 12 months, we can bonus depreciate that. And right now it's been about 100%, but it's going to go down year over year over the next couple of years. I think like the next year is going to be like maybe 80%. It kind of tapers down, but that bonus depreciation still allows us to front load that to those first, that for those, to those first several years which gives us those nice pops of depreciation. And that depreciation is going to offset any of the income that comes that comes off of the property. And so if somebody comes into our assets and they invest you know, $50,000 in one of our assets, they can expect to be having a depreciation benefit of anywhere between 40 to 50% on the low end, upwards to 70, 80, even even 90% depreciation of that investment that first year. And they can take that depreciation to offset the income off the asset, but also to be able to offset some other types of, of gains that are on that they have some for with, with other types of income. Now, I'm not a tax professional, so I'll just make that disclaimer right now. Um, but so you, do, you definitely want to check with your CPA all the different nuances here. But one of the things that I found with my CPA is I had a CPA that was local to me. I really enjoyed working with him. He was a great CPA until I started going into real estate. And once I started going into real estate, he, he started asking me questions about like the real estate professional status and the depreciation benefits and stuff like that. And I was like, if you're asking me these questions, you're not the right guy for me. So I had to find a different CPA that was really knowledgeable in real estate to really be able to help me make it have a great impact on my taxable liability. And now I, I don't pay federal income tax right now because all the depreciation that I'm getting is offsetting my income. And it's also because I also have the real estate professional status, which helps to offset my, my income that I have that comes in. And so I think it's a great benefit for real estate investors is to be able to have the ability to have that differentiation offset the income that you're getting off of it, but also offset some of the other income, whether if you're an active investor, it can potentially offset some of your active income, whether it's in real estate or in a W-2 or your spouse, if you're filing jointly, you can offset spousal income as well. And then also, uh, if you are, if you don't have, you're not an active real estate investor, then you can have that, that, that depreciation offset other passive gains. So if you have passive gains and other types of investments, whether it be real estate or stocks or whatever, it can help to offset some of those gains as well. And of course, you know, when you, when you go to sell the asset, you know, there's, that's, that's the real beauty of these types of assets. And what we do at PassiveInvesting.com is when we go to sell an asset and we've now grown that, that, that nugget from 50,000 to say 100,000 or 150,000. We can now do what's called a 1031 exchange on the back end and defer even longer those capital gains. And if we can continue to defer those capital gains until you pass away, when it turns over to your heirs, then at that time, the basis of the property resets to the current value of the property at that time and allows you to effectively pay zero uh, uh, capital gains tax if you can continue to do that. You can still live off of the, the income that you're, that you're spending off of each one of the investments as you go throughout. So with our, our investments, what we do is we give investors the option to 1031 exchange or liquidate out whenever we go to exit a deal and move on to the next asset. And so up to this point, we've been able to exit eight deals and we've been able to successfully execute uh, those 1031 exchanges into the next asset uh, successfully and be able to allow our investors to continue to um, offset those gains uh, from, from one investment to the next. I'm sure Stig hearing... 70, 80, 90% and the audience hearing that, that high of depreciation percentages are, are their ears are probably uh, going up. They're probably excited, but on the back end, there, there can be this concept of depreciation recapture. Talk to us a bit about how that impacts your property and some of your investors. Yeah. So, you know, whenever you go to sell the asset, if you do not 1031 exchange and you liquidate out, then you'll be stuck subject to two different types of taxes. You'll have the depreciation recapture tax, and then you'll have the, uh, the, the capital gains tax. And so if you have, if you have obviously, you've been receiving the depreciation, uh, the negative K-1s, if you will, at the end of the year, where you've been able to use some of that depreciation to lower your income to effectively pay no income tax, 
then of course, when you sell the asset, there's, that's where that depreciation recapture comes in. And they're going to say, okay, well, you already took a benefit for the last you know, three to five years on this depreciation. Now that you've sold, you've liquidated out, and you did not do a 1031 exchange, we're going to recapture what we should have captured back when you used that. And so that's why it's, it's powerful to use the 1031 because we want to make sure we can continue to defer that as long as possible. And if we can do that all the way up until we die and pass it over, then the recapture, uh, the, the, the depreciation recapture and the capital gains uh, goes away. On the 1031 exchanges, is that a decision that PassiveInvesting.com is making when they sell their property to go into the next property? Or is that on the investor basis? The, inve- the investors have the opportunity to make the decision as to whether or not they want the 1031. So if we have, say, you know, 20% of our investors that says, hey, I want to liquidate out, we can liquidate out those investors when we sell that asset. And the other 80% they can actually move on to the next asset. And so the next asset that we 1031 exchange into is, is not a choice that the investors have. It is one, another choice that we choose that next asset and move on. Sometimes we already know in the t depths we can tell the investors which asset we have chosen. So they can decide whether or not they want to 1031 into that asset. Uh, but usually at that point in time, most investors don't really have um, that much concern about it because number one, they trust us because we're always invested alongside of our investors in each one of our assets. So they know we have a vested interest to make sure that the next vehicle that we put them into is going to be a great solid investment. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're not really too concerned about it in uh, everything else I've just said, but also they don't want to pay the, cap- the, 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 the capital gains tax on it. So even if it's an asset that maybe is not the, 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 the return profile that they would exactly want, then they still trust us to find one that's a good, good, good and solid for them that will still, still produce returns. And they're going to have a higher investment in the, the next one. So if they put, initially put in 50000 and when we sell, their, their new investment amount might be 100000 because of the, the gain that we had on that sale. And so that benefits them because now all their returns are based off of the new larger investment amount, which is the 100000 versus just the, the, the 50000 And then again, you kind of do that three or four times, and now you're at you know, uh, 175 or 200000 Then you go to 300000 and like 600000 And so you, you, then you can see how it can build on itself as you go from one asset to the next asset, and you continue to live off of the cash flows, and the actual principal continues to grow over time. For anyone that is just hearing this 1031 exchange conversation for the first time, it's also known as a swap to you drop. So if you do a quick Google search, you can check out 1031 exchanges under its other name uh, from time to time. But Dan, earlier in the conversation, you alluded to the 320 unit luxury apartment complex in Savannah, Georgia, that you and your team at PassiveInvesting.com are acquiring right now. As part of that deal structure, investors are being offered the opportunity to choose between two different classes of shares. There's class A, which is preferred equity, and then there's class B, which is the common equity. Many of the listeners of our show are stock investors, and therefore they're familiar with preferred stock and common stock within the realm of stock investing, but they might not be so within a real estate deal. Why has your team chosen to offer these two different options? And what do these options offer to investors? You know, we, we started offering these two, two types of share classes uh, several years ago. And it was primarily because we had an, uh, we had a, a subset of investors that wanted to have you know it's, I say guaranteed returns but it's, we can't guarantee returns as you know these are investments so um, there nothing is guaranteed but uh, when you are in a preferential tr- a, a position in the capital stack and you have a preferred return so on our on our class A shares we typically offer a a nine percent preferred return. Um, and then and if, and if, if they invest more than 250000 then they get a 10% preferred return. But they, it, with that preferred return, there's no participation in the upside over and above that. But what they get is they get a preferential treatment in the, in the capital stack where they get their returns before the class B investors. And then they also get their capital back before the class B investors. And it's usually only about, only about 20 to 30% of the, the capital stack. So the deal would have to go really south. I mean, like really, really south for them not to get their return or for them not to be able to get their capital back because they are sitting in that, in that preferential treatment position. And that's why I say it's, it's as close to a guarantee as we can get uh, is being in that preferential treatment stack or uh, preferential treatment in the capital stack. And you know, we, we do get questions from investors like, why would anybody want to invest in that if you could invest in class B and get a 7% preferred return and then have the opportunity to get 15, 20, 25% return on these types of investments. And the, the answer to that is, is it really just depends on the investor. 
because some investors are more, more risk averse than others. And so they might want to do a blended approach where they do like 50% in class A and 50% in class B. And they have this kind of nice blended return profile on the same investment. And we also have investors that are maybe a little bit older and they don't necessarily really care too much about the appreciation. They want to the hire cash flow so they can live off those cash flows during retirement or whatever. And so there's a, there's a lot of different dynamics there, but we don't usually have a large portion of our capital stack for class A. So it usually fills up pretty quick. And then we, we, we don't have any more that can go into class A, right? So the large majority, and I'll give you an example. So like actually in, uh, in the Meritor Grove deal, uh, which is out in Savannah, Georgia, uh, that deal has the two class shares and it's a $35.3 million capital raise. And the total purchase price is close to $100 million, I think like 90, 96, 97 million. So it's a large deal. But of that $35.3 million that we're raising for the equity side, only about maybe three to four million is set aside for class A. So only about 10% of the capital stack is really there for, for that class A stack. And so you can see that being in, a, being in a class A position is a really good thing. It has a very, very low risk when you're trying to invest in that. And so when you when, when somebody wants those higher cash flows, it's a great opportunity for them to be able to invest in that shared class to get those higher cash flows. And then of course, again, you are giving up the opportunity for the other side. They're giving up that opportunity to have that 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 safer kind of, kind of almost guarantee, if you will, on the return. So, Dan, the the luxury apartment complex we just discussed there in Mandalay Grove uh, that was built in 2016, and it now has nearly a full occupancy. Ninety six percent of the numbers I'm looking at right now from early March. Now, the age of the property and the listing photos led me to believe that the property is in great condition. And then despite this, the offering states that there's a potential for a 24.7% annualized return for a 2.24 equity multiple for the Class B common equity over a five-year hold period. How are these potential returns to be achieved for investors? And what is the business plan for this property? So uh, what's, what, what, one of the things that we try to do is we try to buy assets that either are direct from the developer so they have some opportunity for you know, organic rent growth, or we try to buy them from uh, people that we have bought from in the past that have good quality assets. And this particular asset is the, 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 the rents are actually under market, and also the amenity set is under market. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go into this asset, and, and, and there's, also, um, there's also some deferred maintenance, that some different items that we have, we've even noticed that we want to clean up to be able to improve the property and improve the community. And so being able to do that allows us to be able to uh, look at our competitor set and see what are some of the other comp properties doing from an amenity set that are, that are very attractive. And then we can start to add some of those amenity sets to our property, which will allow us to be able to have the opportunity to increase the growth of the rents because we're now starting to be more competitive with the rents that has come in. That has come in. And a lot of it has to do with you know, location, right? So if you're in a great location and you have a, a, maybe a little bit of a, of, a, of a lower amenity set, people still might want to drive an extra five or 10 minutes, if you will, to be able to get to a, a location that would allow them to be, you know, maybe uh, have, have, a, have a few more amenities on, to the, on the property. And so for us, we always look at that competitor set and see what are the competitors doing? Why are they able to achieve a little bit higher rents than what we're doing right now? And what can we do on the existing property that, that would allow us to be able to go in and to be able to improve the property and to be able to maybe make some renovations? And so for us, in addition to some of the exterior things like the, the pool, enhancing the pool deck and adding a new dog park with some fencing, some nice, nice sod in there, and, uh, and also doing some additional landscaping and replacing a lot of the dead plants that are surrounding the property. Um, we're also going to be updating some of the fitness equipment. And then one of the other things that we're looking at doing on the interior is maybe updating some of the, the, the kitchen and the bath plumbing fixtures and having a more modern lighting picture, lighting, lighting package, package inside the property. Um, including maybe even adding some of the ceiling fans. And then one of the things that's really popular right now is increasing um, is increasing the uh, uh, or adding the, the technology to the unit. So you have this, these technology package packages that you can add to the unit, which with like smart thermostats and things like that, that would allow us to be able to increase the rent and achieve rents of premiums of up to a dollar per square foot, which would be, get us more in line with the competitor set that's around the property. Dan, for a second here, talk to us a bit about why you're focused so heavily on increasing the rent and doing these types of activities that are going to drive the rent increase rather than just a, not just from a cash flow perspective, but explain how that impacts the valuation of that property. 
Yeah. So, you know, when we, one of the things that you have to look at when you're buying these properties is the exit, the exit, right? And one of the things that the exit is based off of, or really the only thing that is based off of is the NOI, the net operating income. And so there's two different ways to be able to affect the NOI. One is to go in, improve the property, spend some, some money to do some renovations and spend those CapEx dollars to improve the property and to get it to a better quality asset that you can that'll allow you to be able to charge more. And then the second thing is to reduce expenses. And so that's one of the things that we're really good at is just going into a property, seeing what's missing in that property, be able to you know, add value from that perspective, but then also to be able to look at the expenses and see where can we shave off some expenses so it still allows us to increase that income. And then the types of assets that we try to acquire are in great quality locations, right? So we try to look at assets in primary or at least high-end secondary markets where we know there's lots of competition for, 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 for those types of assets. And some people might be scared sometimes of competition, but we actually look at it as almost like a litmus test. If there's not co any competition, we don't want to invest there. And so if you look at cap rates, which is how you value a property, if you look at those cap rates um, and you say, okay, if I, I, want, I want to get a higher cap rate, right? Because a lot of like, you know, gurus and real estate, you know, uh, coaches and stuff like that, that will tell people, go look for high cap rate um, of assets. Well, I mean, high cap rate assets are usually in markets that have low competition. And the only way they can get investors to go invest there is to raise the cap rate. So that, then that, of course, again, reduces their valuation, but also reduces the valuation on the exit as well. And especially right now in the market where we're in, you know, we have very, very compressed cap rates right now. And even in these markets where you normally would have seen like 10 and 11 and 12 percent cap rates, these tertiary and even quaternary markets, you're now starting to see those inch down to you know five, six, and seven percent. But what's going to happen when we have some sort of you know economic you know correction, if you will, uh, you're going to start to see those cap rates go back up again, right? And then the primary markets and those kind of higher and secondary markets, you're not going to see a major shift. You might see like a fifty to seventy-five, maybe a hundred basis point increase in the cap rates. But when you start to go into buy assets at a six, seven, and eight percent. And this type of an environment in a tertiary and quarterly market, when you go to sell, you're going to have a harder time because now you're going to be having to sell at a 10, 11, 12 percent or maybe even 13 or 14 percent. So those values of those properties are going way down. And so for us, we want to be able to buy assets that are in low cap rate environments to be able to have those higher exit potentials. And to give you kind of an example of those exit potentials and kind of the time and energy and effort that are involved with it when it comes to the valuations and the cap rates, if we buy an asset in a 5% cap rate market, and we buy another asset in an 8% cap rate market, let's say that they're, they're, not, they're very similar assets. We spend the same amount of time, energy, and effort on them. We do some renovations on each one. We've increased the net operating income by $100,000. Well, on a 5% on a, on a, on a cap rate environment, we've increased that net operating income by $100,000, and the value of the property has increased by $2 million. But if we look at that same $100,000 in an 8% cap rate environment, we've only increased the valuation on that particular market by, or that particular property, property in an 8% cap rate environment by $1.25 million. So you can see that the exits for the same amount of time, energy, and effort are much better in a, in a, higher, in a higher quality market that has lower cap rates. And that's what we go after with these types of assets. I can definitely speak to personally the the quality of Savannah as an area. I was actually just down there last month and spent some time in downtown Savannah. So definitely can speak to it myself. It's a great market. As part of that capital structure for the property at Mariner Grove in Savannah, you guys have a private loan at 74% loan to value with an adjustable interest rate of approximately 3.8% with five years of interest only payments. How are a rising interest rates impacting this variable debt product and this deal? Were you able to purchase an interest rate cap to mitigate risk prior to interest rates rising dramatically recently? So right now, if you know anything about the debt market, uh, interest rate caps are becoming more and more expensive. And so, yes, you know the lender requires us to buy these interest rate caps because they want to mitigate their risk as well of this increasing interest rate environment. And so, yes, we, we have been able to purchase that interest rate cap. And what we've done strategically is, is we bought a short-term interest rate cap over the next kind of two to three years, which allows us to be able to get, kind of renegotiate the rate for the next two to three years as we're continuing to, to, to uh, stay into this particular asset. 
But it is possible because this is a, a, a kind of private loan or bridge loan option that has it's a five year kind of three one one option. We do have the option to be able to refinance in two or three years into a fixed rate debt at that time if we want, pull out some in capital and return that back to our investors. So there's a lot of different options here, but from that uh, from 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 a debt perspective, um, there is there is risk there right now, right? Because there is some volatility in the market, and it is possible that the interest rates will continue to rise. And you know, a lot of the economic economists are saying it is going to continue to rise, uh, a rise, but rise. It's going to continue to rise in this environment. And what's going to happen is is that the cash flows of the property will re- be reduced. And so investors have to expect that if interest rates do rise, there is going to be some cash flow fluctuation. So it's going to affect some of our project projections. Um, but the thing is, is that we can't, when we underwrite, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't speculate, right? We, we have never speculated with our underwriting. It's always been what's happening in the current environment and can we plan for the speculative side of things, right? But we, we, we don't underwrite for it. So what I mean, I we plan for, we talked earlier about having ample operating reserves, right? So if there is some major shift in the debt market, we have this large increase in the end, we're in the rate and we start and it starts to impact cash flows. The biggest thing that's going to do is, is they're going to reduce in the short term, the, the, the actual cash flows that are going to be distributed to investors in the short term, but they're still not going to be, you know, uh, and we're not, we're still, the property is still not going to be in a position where it can't meet the debt service, right? We'll still be able to meet the debt service. We'll still be able to, uh, produce great solid returns for investors on the full cycle into the deal. It's just in the short term, because of that shifting of the debt market and where it's going to be, it's going to change. And that's, that's also, it's the, it's the, it's the nice thing and also the bad thing about floating rate debt, right? Because with floating rate debt, you, in, in a great economy, when the, when, the, when the interest rates are kind of at a, 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 on the low end, right, um, we, we get the benefit, right? And then as, as, as the Fed starts to try to shift their policies or whatever, they start to increase the rates, we kind of get the brunt end of it, right? But then again, once they start to shift them back down, we get the nice benefit of it. So this, that's the nice thing about the floating rate. So it should hopefully equalize over the life of the deal. Um, but Right now, we are starting to shift um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a shift to start to see that sometimes it's better to go into some fixed rate debt. But even fixed rate debt right now is, 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 is expensive. Um, and the problem with fixed rate debt right now is that the, the, the debt coverage service ratio that they that that need on that, on, that, on that fixed rate debt is pretty low. And so based on the current cap rates in the environment right now, and the, the debt service coverage ratio, we're starting to see that the loan to values, and the loan to costs are going down. So it's going down to 50, 55% on some of these higher quality assets just because of the valuations on the properties. And they want to make sure that the debt coverage service ratio is in line to make sure that the debt will continue to be paid. Hey, everybody. Trey Lockerbie here from We Study Billionaires. And I wanted to tell you about a new company that I absolutely love, and that is called Trade. Trade combines two of my favorite things, coffee and and technology. So what you do is you go to drinktrade.com. There's a super simple survey that you take, and then it tells you which coffee they're going to send you that you are literally guaranteed to love. Meaning if you don't love it, they'll send you a new bag of coffee for free. And from there, you can keep experimenting. So you're not falling into the same rut of drinking the same coffee over and over and over again. There are so many different types of roasters, levels of roast, beans from different parts of the world. There's plenty to nerd out on here. So why not be adventurous and try some new stuff? After I took the quiz, they sent me a bag from Sight Glass Coffee in Northern California, and it's literally my favorite coffee of all time. Normally, I've been drinking a coffee where I have to sweeten it with honey and almond milk, but this coffee, I could actually drink it black. It was so delicious just on its own. And right now, Trade is offering subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking the quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let trade find the perfect coffee for you. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off. Mariner Grove that we've been discussing is just one of the opportunities that you guys have available at passiveinvesting.com. One of the other ones is a self-storage fund, which similar to Mariner Grove, you guys offer class A and class B shares. The class B shares for this fund have a potential annualized return of 21%, the potential IRR of 18%, also over a similar whole period of about five to seven years. With investors' money only being able to be invested in one place at a time, it is important for someone to consider their opportunity cost. How should an investor consider multiple investment opportunities for their portfolio? 
what should investors look at just beyond the potential returns that they could achieve? I mean, I mean, one of the things, so when we first started PassiveInvesting.com, um, we made the decision that we wanted to name it PassiveInvesting.com and not MultifamilyInvesting.com or SelfStorageInvesting.com because we wanted to leave ourselves open to the opportunity to add additional asset classes as we continue to grow. And so what we have seen over the, over the last couple of years is that our investors have started to request additional assets. So we are, the majority of our holdings right now is in multifamily, followed up by self storage, and then car, express car washes, which is a, a topic that we may get into today, maybe not, um, and then uh, also hotels, right? And so um, from, a, from, a, from an asset allocation perspective, it's great to have a diversification. So you know, for, for many of you who are listening that have a portfolio in the stock market, you're not going to put all of your all of your eggs in one basket, right? You're not going to put all of your eggs in Rivian. If you did, you'd probably be in a bad position right now if you, if you did the IPO, right? Um, but or even or even Didi, right? If you did, if you put your, your eggs in the Didi, Didi stock, I mean, it's it's really tanked right now. Um, but anyway, so uh, you you want to do that, create that diversification in your portfolio, right? So same thing in in, in, a, in a real estate portfolio as a passive portfolio, you want to make sure that you have some diversification. Obviously, you want to have a diversification of markets within the same asset and also asset classes within the same asset, but you also want to have a diversification in the type of assets that you're investing in. So right now, like I said, we have the multifamily assets that we have. We have the self-storage assets. We have our express car washes and our hotels. Every single one of them actually has a different risk and return profile. And what's interesting is, is if you look at it from a, uh, a, a the ability to be able to shift and pivot quickly, Multifamily, we have a one-year uh, lease agreement, right? They're, they're, they're renting that property, renting that, that unit for one year. In uh, self stores, they're renting it for 30 days. In hotels, they're renting it for one day. In express car washes, they're renting it for five minutes, right? So we can actually pivot a lot faster in a lot of these, these ones that are even outside of multifamily. So if the market starts to shift and change, we can adjust pricing to mitigate some of that risk and those and some of those these asset classes very quickly. It can pivot a lot faster. And so, you know, those are kind of the four primary assets we have right now. And as we continue to grow and expand, we will expand into some other asset classes like industrial and small warehouses and uh, and medical office building assets that we know that can do really well in any type of economic recession and also cash flow very well as well. Interesting. So, uh, Dan, both of the investment opportunities we just discussed, they have this defined hold period between five to seven years. And the, the question uh, then come, becomes, how does PassiveInvesting.com determine what the right, when the right time is to dispose of an asset? Um, one could easily imagine a situation where the asset is performing really well, uh, but then the predetermined hold period has been reached. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that we always uh, do right now is we're underwriting every deal on a five-year hold and time horizon. And, and the reason why we say five to seven years is because it is possible in, in, in you know, five years that it's not the right time to sell. And so we don't want to set up our operating agreements and our offerings to the point where we are forced to sell at any point in time. Because if there is a, an economic recession and there's a downturn in five years from now, we don't want to be forced to sell in that environment. And so the investors in these operating agreements give us the flexibility to make the right decisions for them of when to actually sell the asset. And so what we do to make sure we are, we're always trying to figure out when is the right time to sell, every year that we're in the deal, in each one of these offerings, we get a BOV, which is like broker opinion of value, which allows us to determine what can we sell this property for right now in the current environment. And then once we get that, that analysis back, we can determine is right now a good time to sell. And I'll give you a quick example of that. Recently, on one of our assets that we sold last year, I'll also give you an example of one that uh, that's, be, that's being sold right now. It's under contract just uh, just this week. Um, but so last year, uh, about about two years ago, prior to the selling this asset, uh, we held on to it for about two and a half years. Actually, we bought it for fifty one point five million. So it's an, it was an asset out of Raleigh, North Carolina, and we uh, held on to it for two and a half years. And in the BOB. Um, last year that we got from the broker, they said that we could sell it for between about 72 to 73 million. And our kind of five-year time horizon and target to sell that asset was to sell it for about 68 to 69 million. 
And so, of course, we're looking at that going, wow, we've only holding this thing for two and a half years. We can go ahead and outperform and achieve the returns we had projected in five years and get it done in two and a half years. And so we, did, we, we pulled the trigger and decided to go ahead and sell that asset. Well, once the, the bid started coming in, we ended up selling it for $79 million. So it was much higher than the BOV. And of course, a little over $10 million more than what the investors uh, were expected to receive on that one, right? Uh, based on the exit price. And so it was a great return for our investors with like a 35% return. It was a phenomenal exit, right? Um, but that's, that, that's what we have to do because if we would have just said, no, we're not going to look at it until you know, year five. Then in year five, the, the market might have been a little bit different and changed. And we might not have gotten 79. Maybe we would have only gotten like the, the, the 72, 73, or maybe even like 68, 69. Who knows, right? So if in the current environment we can sell and outperform the projections, then we'll go ahead and make that decision. And of course, we try to tee it up, like we said earlier, with another asset that we can 1031 exchange those proceeds into. And then right now, another example for you is uh, we have an asset right now out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and we've held on to that for just over two years now, about it's probably closer to two and a half years now as well. And that particular asset, actually, it's only about a, a year and a half, excuse me, it's been a year and a half that we've had that asset. And uh, we were projected to sell it for, I think, like 30, 33, 34 million, somewhere like that. And we've already got an offer and we're signing the contract this week for 39 million on that one. Right. So for us, it made sense. Now, there's another asset because of the volatility of the market right now that's located in Charlotte, North Carolina, that we put on the market. We we're going to go sell it. And the offers came in and they weren't hitting our price that we originally were, were given by the, by, the, by the brokers. And so we, you know, we said, you know what? It's a great asset. It's cash flowing very nicely. We're not even we don't have to sell right now. So if we're not going to get what we, what, we, what we want for that asset. We're just going to continue to hold on to it for the entire hold period. Right. Uh, not for the entire whole period, but at least until the next year, we get another BOV to see if that is that the right time to sell. So to answer your question, we always look at this on a regular basis. From our director of asset management, our asset management team is always on top of this, making sure that we know when is the right time to be able to sell that asset so we can maximize the returns for investors. As you were talking about your approach to diversification at PassiveInvesting.com, I was thinking back to a few weeks ago, I had Jay Papazan on our real estate podcast. And for those who don't know, Jay Papazan is the right-hand man of Gary Keller, who founded Keller Williams. And Jay Papazan is the co-author for some of the most best-selling business books and real estate books of all time. And so one of his main focuses is focusing on this one thing. He says, you really need to drill down and focus on one thing. So I'm curious how you balance diversification within those multiple asset classes versus really doubling down and focusing on what you guys are really good at? You know, it's, it's a great question because, you know, even our investors, as they continue to see our growth, you know, right now we've acquired just over a billion in assets in our, in our, in our group since 2018, since we came together as PassiveInvesting.com. And uh, we've had seen, a, seen, a, seen a significant trajectory of the amount of money and capital we've been able to bring in. And it's, it's all non-institutional capital we've been able to raise. So we raise money from just private, high net worth, accredited investors. And so I, I'll give you kind of a trajectory of where, how we've been. So in 2018, we raised $4 million from our investors. In 2019, we raised $32 million. During the middle of COVID, we raised $61 million. And then last year, we had a banner year and raised over $196 million from our investors to be able to acquire the assets that we've acquired. And so this year, we're, we're on, a, on a great trajectory. Even just in the first quarter, we've raised over $110 million. So we're on this trajectory. And so we have had investors investors that have reached out and said, hey, you're growing really fast. I really like it. I really enjoy investing with you. Um, and, but I'm concerned. Like, I'm concerned that you're growing way too fast. Maybe you're spreading yourself too thin with too many alternative asset classes. And, uh, and so uh, you know, we, I, when, when we, I'll, I'll kind of share with you a story from, uh, I, I actually own four non-surgical orthopedic medical clinics. And when we were growing those clinics, one of the, the challenges that we saw is we went, when we grew when we actually grew to the second location we went from one location to the second location we ended up taking our entire core solid team from the primary location the first location and moving them to this new location because my thought was I don't want that new location to fail so I want to give them give it its best opportunity to be successful but guess what happened we took our eyes off of the primary one right of the first at the first uh, location and it really started to suffer and we didn't notice it until like three or four months down the road. And so there's a lot of things that we learn in that during that time frame uh, and, and that during that growth period, which allows us to be able to expand into the third, 
occurred in the fourth location successfully without having any dramatic impact on the, the, other, the, the first two locations. And so what we decided is that, you know what, in order to grow and expand these clinics, we have to hire on ahead of time and actually put these people in some training in, in this system training so that when we hire, when we, when we open up this next location, we already have another core team that can support that location. So as we started to grow these clinics, that's what we learned. And then also we learned that uh, we can't monitor the numbers on a quarterly basis anymore. We have to monitor the numbers on a daily basis to be able to make sure we can shift and pivot as necessary. And so being able to set those KPIs and watch them on a regular basis like that allows us to be able to make those pivots and those changes a lot faster instead of waiting until there's already a major problem in place, right? And so we learned a lot about that going through there. And so because of the learning curve that we had expanding those clinics, uh, we learned that even in this business with PassiveInvesting.com, if we want to add on a new asset class, so when we, when we, when we were just multifamily, we said, you know what, we got a lot of feedback from our investors that they want us to, and be able to you know, give, provide them with some opportunities to invest in some, some self-storage assets. We actually set out to find a self-storage team that can help us be able to, to, to manage that business unit so that we don't take our focus off of the primary and the core aspects of what we're doing with multifamily. So we hired on a team to manage that particular asset class. And then as we started to branch out into hotels and express car washes, we again hired on a team just for those different, we call them kind of business units, if you will, those business units to be able to manage those so that we have this diversification of, of our team members across the, t across the board. Now, there are certain things that you can share across the asset classes like finance and accounting and stuff like that that are, you know, that are pretty easy to kind of share, right? But when I say share, it doesn't mean you just had the same one or two people when you had multifamily managing that side of things. When you had on additional asset classes, you got to hire more team members to work in that account. Yeah, that's that's team, right? That's and so as we continue to grow, we're able to grow that way. And one of the things from the very beginning that Danny, Brian, and myself decided on early on is that, you know, each one of these assets that we acquire, we charge an asset management fee, right? Usually between about one to 2% to be able to manage those assets. And we basically told ourselves from the very beginning that we are not going to take those asset management fees and put them in our own pockets as partners. We're going to take those management fees and we're going to put them into our PassiveInvesting.com LLC operating account. And it's going to be there to support the growth of our team because we know that more and more assets that we close and we acquire, of course, those fees also go up month after month after month, right? And so as those grow, our team can grow with the portfolio. And right now we're sitting at about 39, 40 full-time team members that are working full-time with PassiveInvesting.com. It's because we know that we have to continue to hire people to be able to support the growth and the trajectory that we're on so we can make sure we can protect the investments for our investors, but also, again, for our own investments because our goal is to grow our wealth as well as our investors' wealth and our family's wealth together, right? We can only do that if we continue to have that, 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 that direct alignment of interest. So to go full circle, uh, I think it's important to go back to the basics. And one of the eight topics that people will learn about at your multifamily investor nation convention, uh, next one, shall, and I just wanted to intersect and say, Shag is going to be there. I mean, how awesome is that? But <laughs> to continue with the, uh, with, the, with the question, one of those uh, eight topics, that is how to select and analyze the market. Um, the Mariner Grove acquisition we discussed previously is one of your first acquisitions in the Savannah, Georgia market, which is a part of the South that is benefiting from this population growth, 10.2% and leading the West, Midwest and Northeast. How do you and your team analyze a market like Savannah prior to investing? Well, just to kind of, you know, tag a little bit in there about the MFI income that you mentioned come up in Charlotte in June. Um, not only do we have Shaq, we also have Jocko Willink. So Jocko is the author of Extreme Ownership and the Dichotomy of Leadership. He's a, he's a former U.S. Navy SEAL, and so we're excited to have him there. A lot of people know who he is, and uh, great to have shared the stage with him. And, of course, we have Barbara Corcoran coming in as well from Shark Tank. So um, it's really exciting. It's going to be a great event. There's a lot of excitement coming around that event. And uh, we've been doing a virtual event for our multifamily investor nation group for, for quite some time. Even before COVID, we were one of the first, or if not the first group in multifamily to do an event that was virtual. And we've done uh, almost, I think, like seven or eight virtual uh, multifamily investor nation events. And then now we decided that our, our group is, is, is big enough or our, our, they wanted to do a live in-person event. And of course, we wanted to do it with a bang. And so that's why we have these great celebrity speakers that each one of them have a story around, except for maybe Jocko. I'm going to work on him a little bit. He, his more his mindset is 
is more around the leadership aspects of what we're doing. But but, but uh, Barbara um, Corcoran and Shaq both have a large portfolio in real estate. So we're going to really dive, dive into their investment strategies and uh, give opportunities for our investors to rub shoulders with them to be able to talk with them a little bit. But um, going back to uh, your question about mar- selecting the market of Savannah, right? Um, so one of the things that we look for is we want to make sure that we have markets that have uh, significant population growth. And we want to make sure we have markets that have uh, significant job growth, right? And we also want to see markets that have uh, uh, we want to see markets that are that are stabilized by some form of of, of industry, right? So we want to see, especially like publicly traded companies, right? So those, those blue chip corporations are really what provide some stability in a market. And so we look for markets that have that. Of course, you know, being the um, the largest port on the on the and, and on the and, the, and, the, and on the East Coast really helps the story, right? Because there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, industry that comes in from that, which allows us to be able to see that there's a lot of growth that's happening in that market, and there's a lot of growth that's going to continue to happen in that market especially with this type of an asset, especially with some of the, the colleges and the universities that are there. There's a lot of growth that's going to happen in that market. And so we're, it's, it's, it's poised for a lot of continued growth. Even though it's already had some growth, it's poised for some continued growth because, number one, it's a great market, right? For as far as like being in, being in Savannah, the, the temperature is great, the, the weather is nice, and it's, it's, it's right on, on the coast there. I would say that um, it's, it's one of those types of markets that, that at, at the beginning, we, we looked at it, and then as we continue to follow it and monitor it, we, we knew that we wanted to be in that, as, in, that, in that market. So we've been looking at assets. I mean, even right now, um, there's another asset that we're invested final on in that market that we are hoping to get. It's not awarded to us yet, but another sister property to Mariner Grove. Um, but this property is going to – this Mariner Grove property is going to do really, really well. And the, the owners of this property right now, uh, we've purchased multiple assets assets from them in the past. They're a great group. They, they, they take care of their assets. And so we're not worried about any like major deferred maintenance that's going to cause any major issues with the property. Of course, it's only a 2016 vintage asset. So we're not worried about water main breaks or anything like that happening on the property or having to replace the roof during our tenure or, or anything like that. So it's a great quality asset that's going to continue to cash flow, continue to do really well. It's going to have a great exit for us and our investors and those that join us. Fantastic. Uh, Dan, as we, as we wrap up the show, uh, we want to give you the chance to tell the audience about the best place to connect with you and also about this amazing investing conference. Um, I also already said that Shaq is going to be there. So if that is not enough reason, uh, Dan, please take it away. I'm sure there are other good reasons why they should go to the conference. Sure, sure. So if you're interested in, in kind of checking out the conference or whatever, uh, it's very easy. Just go to MFINCON. Uh, MFIN stands for Multifamily Investor. For nation, so mfincon.com. Um, it's the Multifamily Investor Nation Convention. It's in Charlotte, June 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Uh, just coming up pretty soon next month. And so we'd love to have you go check that event out, and, and, uh, and we look forward to seeing you there and meeting you in person and, and shaking your hand. If you want to follow me more, you can go to my LinkedIn. So you can actually just go to linkwithdan.com. That'll bring you straight over to my LinkedIn profile. You can link with me there and connect with me further. And then if you want to follow us more for it with our PassiveInvesting.com group, you can go to our website, PassiveInvesting.com. On the top right-hand corner of the page is a blue button that says, Join the Passive Investor Club. If you click that button, fill out the form, one of our investor relations team members will reach out to you, discuss your investment goals to see if our group is the right fit for you. And that way you'll be apprised of some of the, some of the offerings that are available to you. And if you go to our website, you can also go there and look at this uh, Mariner Grove asset. And so the details on it, it's under our current offerings tab on the website. So you can see more details on this particular, particular offering. It's, uh, it's likely to fill up pretty soon. But um, if you go there and it's not available, then you know, make sure you sign up for our list. And there'll be a prize some of the future offerings that we have available coming up. Fantastic. And we'll definitely make sure to link to all of that in, in our show notes. Uh, very excited about this, Dan. And, and Robert and I are excited about looking more into, into those properties. You know, it's it's rare we, that we get the we have different advertisers on the show, but it's rare that we get an opportunity to to invest together with them. You know, eating our own cooking, and we sort of like feel good about you know, sharing the upside with with our audience, uh, but also sharing the downside. I think just sharing your upside isn't a isn't a fair way of of, of doing partnerships. Um, so, Dan, thank you so much for for t- taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with Robert and me here today. I, I hope we can do this again soon. Yes, I really do appreciate you inviting me on and being able to share this information and uh, looking forward to uh, coming back on and sharing some more insights later on as well. 
Fantastic. And just rounding off the interview, I just want to say that if you want to learn more about real estate, make sure to check out Robert's podcast, Real Estate 101 by the Investors Podcast Network. Every week, you will learn everything you need to know about real estate. And Dan will be one of the guests here soon on that show. So with that said, that was all that Dan, Robert, and I had for this week's episode of the Investors Podcast. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 